Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Nelson Leadership Series. It is a, an honor and has become a great pleasure for me to get up here and recount my memories of Chris Nelson to you guys. Um, it's actually become one of the highlights of the year for me. Um, I'd like to start off by recognizing right here in the second row, Mr. John Nelson. Uh, this is Chris's older brother and a... <laughs> and a Landon graduate of the class of 1982. Um, Chris Nelson was my classmate and my very good friend, and he was a member of the great class of 1986, and we lost Chris um, after a long and hard-fought battle with leukemia in 1982 during, our, uh, in 1982 during our freshman year at Landon. And um, as I said, it's, it's a bittersweet pleasure for me to come up here and recount our memories of, of Chris and his time here with us at Landon. Um, but first, I need to go back and properly cite my opening line. Um, last spring at graduation, uh, my friend Steve Amate was up at the podium, and he was introducing the next presenter, and it happened to be one of his classmates and he introduced him as a member of the great class of 1983. And I audibly chuckled at that idea and received a few glances as well um, from some folks who thought perhaps that I was derisively mocking Steve's idea when quite to the contrary, I was admiring the beautiful simplicity of that truism. I think that um, every class at Landon looks back on their years here and sees themselves, right, right, rightly or wrongly, as a great class. And I think that that feeling only strengthens with time. The further you get away from the White Rocks, the more your memories become ideal and all the, the silly pranks seem to fade into the past and everything just seemed like it was perfect here at Landon. Um, the truly great classes, though, are the classes that come to this realization while they're still here at Landon. Those are the classes that can unify and come together as one, and they gather strength from that unity. And I think Mr. Foley would probably call that a polity, but I'm sure for you guys who are scrambling to get through your day, just trying to keep your head above water, get ready for that math test last period, race out to football practice, handbell performance on Sunday, paper that next Monday. It's hard to, to vision yourself as a part of that unity. You're just trying to get through it all and make it all work for you. But that short-sighted mindset, unfortunately, blinds you and ultimately prevents you from joining in to that polity, to that unity and strength that every class has. The potential is always there. It's just a question of whether the class exercises that potential. And that was one of the most extraordinary things about Chris Nelson. Even back in the lower school, he saw our class as one. The rest of us were just trying to get our ties tied on our way back from Mr. Duquette's PE class and avoid Mr. Murray, who's going to yell at us for taking our time coming back from PE. But Chris, he, he saw the big picture, he felt the big picture, and he knew that our class was destined for great things. And from the very beginning, he had us organized and moving as one. Um, in 1953, 24 years after the founding of Landon, a great tradition began, and it was called the Shrimp Bowl. And the Shrimp Bowl was one of the great tangible lesson teachers that Landon ever had. You see, you come in as a third grader, dazed and confused, not knowing what's going on, and just about the time you start to get your bearings, the fourth grade absolutely pummels you in the shrimp bowl. And that is your first exposure to true failure, to defeat. But no sooner are you back in that lower school, the lower school masters pull you up by the bootstraps they put you back to work, and exactly one year later, 
you get to turn around and pummel the third grade in football. It is the foundation of the land and education. You fail, you persevere, and you succeed. It's a great model, and it was taught to us very tangibly and very quickly in the lower school. Well, exactly 24 years after the first game, ironically, on a beautiful fall day in 1977, the great class of 1986 emerged victorious over the fourth grade in that very same shrimp bowl. Much to the dismay of the fourth grade, to the raucous delight of the seniors who were cheering us on, and I, I believe to the consternation of the lower school masters. Um, I think there was actually a rumor going around that there was a double secret meeting that afternoon to discuss what they were going to do with the unbridled enthusiasm of these third graders who thought they now own the lower school. And for a few days we did. Um, but the, uh, that victory, while we never got that lesson of humility that was so important that I discussed earlier, and I can see a few teachers shaking their head, uh, yeah, that's right, we did learn a more important lesson that day. And it was the power and unity of our class. Um, Chris Nelson was not the best football player on the field that day, but I guarantee you that those third graders would not have won that game without Chris Nelson. He was the one who had us out there, a bunch of 30, 30 youthful, exuberant kids working as one, and we pulled off a miracle. Um, I was talking to Mr. Jacoby a couple weeks ago about this very assembly. And he stopped me, and he looked at me, and he said, WT, I will never forget that boy. And none of us who knew him ever will. He was an incredible member of the great class of 1986, and he was an incredible member of this school. He was absolutely unforgettable. And I'd like to ask you all to do something for me. Um, before the end of the school year, it doesn't have to be today or next week, but before the end of the school year, go down to the gym and you'll see those murals up there in the atrium recognizing Landon's rich athletic tradition, great moments, great teams, great coaches, Davis, Jacoby, Bordley, Lum, uh, Barton. And if you look closely, you'll see a picture from the fall of 1977. Chris Nelson was number 27. Go take a look. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Miller, and thank you to the Nelson family. Our keynote speakers for today are Senator Richard Luger, Republican from Indiana, and Senator Byron Dorgan, Democrat from North Dakota. As mentioned previously, our theme for this year is civil and bipartisan leadership in uncivil times. These two gentlemen have lived their lives completely devoted to civility and fully dedicated to bipartisanship. And it is an honor today to have them here with us to share the stage. Whether you are a sixth grader or 12th grader out there, you should listen carefully to Senator Luger and Senator Dorgan. Who knows, maybe someday you may be among the elected 100 senators representing more than 300 million Americans in our country. Even if you have other career plans, you can learn a great deal from these two wise leaders about how to live your lives the right way with civility, respect, honesty, purpose, and kindness. In preparing my introductions of Senator Luger and Senator Dorgan, it quickly became clear that I don't have time to list all of their many, many accomplishments. But here are four highlights that I picked for each of them. We'll begin with Senator Luger. He served in the United States Senate for 36 years. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama in 2013. He was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for the, his bipartisan, bipartisanship work and leadership that helped deactivate more than 7,600 nuclear warheads that were once aimed directly here at the United States. And finally, upon retiring from the Senate, he received his honorary knighthood from the Queen of England. 
It's not a bad resume. Next, Senator Dorgan. He served in the United States Senate for 18 years. Senator Dorgan also served in the Senate leadership for 16 of those years. Prior to that, he served in the House of Representatives for 12 years. Finally, Senator Dorgan is a New York Times bestselling author, having authored two books about economic issues and co-authored two novels, also very impressive. Yes, these are incredibly accomplished men, but more important than that, they are good men. And it is a tremendous honor for us to have them here today with us. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Senator Luger and Senator Dorgan. Before we get into the heart of our program, I'm going to give the senators a couple of minutes just to make a few uh, introductory remarks. Well, thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity uh, to be with my grandson, Preston, and uh, John and Kelly Luger, his parents, and with all of you on this magnificent campus, and with my colleague, Byron Dorgan, who served so well and is the epitome, as you suggested, of bipartisan civility, as well as a very constructive legislator. The subject that you've chosen for today is very timely. It offers us an opportunity really to talk not only about politics in America, but more importantly, about aspirations that I hope that most of you will have. To take positions, to take positions of leadership in our country to work now while you were at Landon on how to become uh, devoted leaders with skills in being able to express your, your opinions, both uh, in terms of verbal and written work, and likewise with the idealism to carry forward the traditions of our American Constitution and things that uh, we have fought for throughout the years. So it's an honor to be here, and I look forward to this conversation. Well, Dick, thank you very much. And uh, I, I'm so proud to be here with Dick Luger. I mean, I, I flew into Moscow, Russia, one day and drove about an hour with uh, the folks I was with to see a site. Uh, and it was a site that Dick Luger and Sam Nunn together with their legislation profoundly changed the, the uh, outcome of the Cold War and what was happening uh, in our world with tensions on nuclear weapons and so on. And so I know about his work firsthand, and it's, it's extraordinary. The tapestry of the Congress is people from all over the country come to that chamber, the House and Senate chambers, very different kinds of people from different parts of the country. It's true with Dick, and it's true with myself. I grew up my first 18 years in a town of 280 people. No lawyer, no dentist, no doctor, no traffic lights, uh, 280 people. I graduated from a high school senior class of nine. I was in the top five. <laughs> and <laughs> that qualifies you for the Senate, by the way, if you're in the top five. But, but my point uh, is to say to you, in a town of 280 people, you know everybody. You know everybody. When you know people, you're much more likely always to be civil to people. And that's what's so important with respect to our politics today, to, to try to think through how do we bring people back together so they know and treat each other with respect. Uh, there's a lot going on in politics that is pretty distasteful to me, and I suspect to Dick and others as well. Uh, our country's better than that, and my hope is we can find ways with this discussion and others to bring people together to get the best of each rather than the worst of both. To spark some dialogue, I have a few questions for you. First one, what do you think are the rudiments or the causes of the uncivil discourse in American politics today? Uh, well, I think a lot of it starts with, uh, 
1988, a Federal Communications Commissioner named Fowler decided that uh, uh, he was going to change the rules so that uh, the, the rules required if you're a broadcaster broadcasting a radio or a television signal, you have a requirement with respect to politics. If you're going to provide one side that opportunity on that broadcast, you have to provide the other side. And uh, it's called the Fairness Doctrine. They repealed that in 1988. That began the growth of talk radio, and it began the growth of cable television in which if you produce a signal, you can just have one side on. And what has happened over the years, many, many years, and some of you will disagree with my analysis of this, but that's, it's my analysis. Uh, over the years, what has happened is that they've become infotainment, attacking each other, producing only one side of the argument, and people who are driving down the street too often these days just tune in to that one radio station they know which will already reinforce their existing belief. And so you've pulled people apart. And then the other thing that has happened in my judgment is the decision by someone serving in the House or the Senate with respect to the kinds of votes they will take and the behavior, the comportment and so on, it has a lot to do with whether they are worried about one of those talk radio or cable television venues and so on will produce a primary challenger in their district or their state because that, that could be pretty dangerous uh, given what's happening with radio and television signals and, and the politics of all of that. So I think that has changed, the, it's just changed a lot of how people uh, vote, how they treat each other, and how, what they believe they have to do to satisfy perhaps a small but nonetheless an unbelievably aggressive segment of their political party in their state or district. I think Byron makes a very, very excellent point. I would uh, simply increase that uh, intensity situation by mentioning another factor, and that is political money. Uh, we, there was a time in which there were at least some limits on how much contributions could be and from where. But uh, that's really been pretty much dispatched. And so as a result, uh, it doesn't matter really in what state or what district you may be located as a member of Congress, uh, you may be facing a scorecard from an interest group in the United States which is grading you on their ideas and the things that are important to them and prepared really to, to spend the sum of money that they think is required to defeat you in a primary or in a general election. Uh, there simply is no bounds to this political money in America presently. And so in addition to the problem of talk radio or biased uh, coverage, uh, there is the augmentation of this with uh, the money to buy more ads or to do negative research. Uh, each one of you needs to be thoughtful about your activities in high school because somebody may in due course, as you seek public life, delve back into precisely what happened to you, what disciplinary activities or difficulties that you had. Uh, it's, a, it's a very personal type of situation, influenced and paid for by political money. I, I would just say, Dick is absolutely right. It's a perversion of democracy in my judgment. And I, I just met two young guys, uh, head of the Young Republicans and the head of the Young Democratic Organization. Let's assume time passes and you run against each other, right? Two really good candidates. Uh, but there is now unlimited funding from undisclosed sources. So it's not just you raising money to campaign with your ideas and you raising money. It's you and your billionaire and you and your billionaire, and no one will know where the money came from at all. It's a complete perversion of, of our system. And it comes from, in my judgment, Citizens United, which was a Supreme Court decision. And it was happening even before then, but that just completely opened the floodgates. You both have experienced the national political scene for many decades. Are we in particularly uncivil times today? Well, we are certainly at a very uncivil time in a way. I would say, however, that um, as I look at it, the situation is one in which the parties, Democratic Party and Republican Party, have various segments, various groups within the parties that um, 
take various stands. Now, some of this may come about by the influence, as we've already discussed in our first responses to questions, but for whatever reason, it makes it very difficult for the party leadership to bring about at least uh, some unity within the party so that there could, in fact, be some degree of negotiation uh, in a conference committee if they finally do pass a bill in one house or the other or they come try to come together. In, in short, we're uh, at, at a point, literally, in which uh, it, it pays some time to be uncivil because it's a way at least of explaining why you are not moving anything. You, it's my way or the highway attitude. Uh, I, I have found that with people who, by and large, in their social life, do not appear to be uncivil, but take on this situation in, in the public display, either because of their fear of being disposed of in primaries or general elections, but political money or other reasons. But uh, likewise, they have found that this is a way of my, playing a role within the party, that uh, a party in which they are not a leader other than the fact that they are provocative. Was there ever a golden age of civility in American politics? And if so, what was that era? I don't know that there was a golden age. I mean, you can go back to the 1800s and find some very uncivil behavior and, and discourse that is pretty pathetic. Mm -hmm. But, but it, is, it, it really has changed. It is, politics is more raw. Um, it, is, it is, in my judgment, uh, less respectful. Uh, I, I think it's very important for certain constituencies for Democrats and Republicans, Democrats perhaps on the far left, Republicans on the far right, uh, they're not very interested in trying to determine, are you the kind of member of the House or the Senate who's interested in uh, compromise? Now, the lubrication of our democracy is compromise. You know, if, if Dick and we disagreed plenty, but we're, we're good friends and we agreed on a lot of things. But if Dick said, here's my position, and I said, well, here's mine, and we're quite a ways apart, the approach we would generally take is try to figure, well, well how do we find some place in between here that at least moves both of our interests forward? There are a lot of folks uh, playing again to the, the constituencies they've created through these radio and television programs and others. They go have their town meetings now, and they play to that crowd, and they say, let me tell you something. If you send me to Washington, D.C., I'm going to give you a promise, and I'll tell you what my promise is. When it comes time, at a key moment, to either stand by your principles or compromise, I'll tell you something. You will never, ever, ever find me, finding me compromising. I just won't do it. When I come back next time and ask for your vote, you'll understand I'm not a compromiser. I'm going to stand by my principles, be damned. Well, that's a good way to decide Congress can't work. Just can't work. It works on the lubrication of good people who, who are willing to work together with good faith and to find compromises that will work for the country. Let me mention just one brighter period in politics that came about in about 1985, as I recall. Uh, uh, President Reagan had been involved in some talks with uh, former leaders of the Soviet Union, and it, it appeared to him and to some around him he might be on the threshold of the first attempt to negotiate some reduction of nuclear weapons. So as a result, uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, <clears throat> negotiations were to begin, and President Reagan, understanding that a treaty needs a two-thirds majority, that by the very nature of it, it's sort of a bipartisan situation and that neither party normally would have had that number of people in the Senate. Uh, he asked if uh, eight members of the Senate from the Democratic Party and eight Republicans would go to Geneva, Switzerland uh, for the beginning of those negotiations and to stay really for a while uh, because uh, he would need their support on both sides of the aisle for something that would be as controversial 
as a reduction of American arms vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. I was uh, privileged to be one of those uh, senators. And uh, as a matter of fact, after a period of a couple of weeks, it was apparent this was not going to be our year. But one thing that occurred, just making Byron's point again, was that uh, we got to know each other. These were eight senators in the leadership of both houses, uh, of, of both parts of the Senate, rather. And uh, we may not have got to know the Russians, although Sam Nunn and I, Sam being a senator from Georgia, a Democrat, who was to become chairman of the Armed Services Committee, actually met with several Russians. We went over to their consulate. We, we sort of tried out our sides in terms of what negotiations might be possible. I mention all of this because uh, six years passed. Uh, during that period of time, uh, Sam and I, during trips to Europe, on Codells or what have you, continued to be in touch with some of these Russians. And came 1991 and the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the Russians uh, came to us and, and said, you know, you've got problems in the United States. Uh, the people that are guarding the weapons that are aimed at you and your cities, as well as your military installations, are deserting. There could be accidents. After 40 years of mutually assured destruction, possibly, there really could be destruction. I said, what do you want from us? They said, we're going to need a lot of your money, for one thing. We're bankrupt. You're experts to help take down the, uh, the missiles. We may, in fact, by the time we're finished, need your armed forces if our nation disintegrates. Now, I, I mention all of this because over a period of time, all of us who came together in Geneva really stayed together. And there was the opportunity at that point with the non luger Property Threat Reduction Act uh, for an opportunity to disarm, literally. The United States disarm, we call it cooperative threat reduction, the Soviet Union, and, and begin taking down, which took 20 years, about uh, 8,000 warheads that were aimed at, uh, every city in the United States could have been leveled with all that they had in that armament. Now, that, in my judgment, I look at as a, a golden age of sorts. It wasn't the only problem facing America, but it was certainly a big one. Uh, and it was one that probably could not have been solved without there being bipartisan leadership and follow through, which continued year after year as appropriations were required for the money to continue taking down those Soviet uh, warheads and missiles. Um, I, I, I hope that if we come to other periods of time, which is really very clear to us that America's interests are in jeopardy, that we as Americans back home are in jeopardy, that we have the good sense, really, to have leadership that brings us together, that uh, brings the po political parties in the Congress into their legislative mode together, and that we have the follow through, really. I think that's possible, but I cite this and take some time to do so as an example, perhaps, of a little bit of a golden age. I, I agree with that, and let me just say, I don't think Dick knows this, but I cleaned out my Senate desk when I retired from the Senate, and um, as I opened that top drawer that goes up, I saw in my desk something I'd always kept, and it was three things. It was a piece of a strut from a, a Soviet bomber, uh, and, and we didn't shoot that bomber down. We didn't shoot the Russian <laughs> bomber down. We sawed that. We sawed the wings off. And that beca that's because Luger Nunn actually provided the funding by which we destroyed Russian bombers by sawing off their wings, not shooting them down. I had ground up copper from submarines that we dismantled and destroyed. And I had a hinge, a hinge that was on a, a missile in the Ukraine with a nuclear warhead on that missile aimed at the United States. That missile is now gone. The warhead is now gone and destroyed. And where that missile once sat, sunflowers grow. And I would just tell you that uh, this is a guy who has an unbelievable legacy of reducing the number of nuclear weapons in our country and safeguarding the nuclear weapons that exist in Russia.
At Landon, we have a civility code, which calls upon all of us to be respectful at all times. Some might say we have on rose-colored glasses to raise respect and civility as important values. In your experience, is the practice of civility practical, easy, or hard? I think it's uh, very practical, as a matter of fact. I was fortunate to have two wonderful parents and uh, a wonderful brother and sister, and uh, we all went to uh, church every Sunday, Sunday school before that and what have you. We grew up uh, turned out in the Methodist church. And uh, from the very beginning, I think we were on the right track. Uh, it was very important, at least, uh, to understand how people could treat each other in that congregation and then outside of it as we went out into the community to be helpful. Um, I found that even if uh, you're attempting to make very strong arguments, you're more likely uh, to be effective if you remain civil and control of your own emotions and control of your own thoughts. And furthermore, if you have at least a, a background of of thoughtfulness about uh, your parents, your family, your neighborhood, your city, uh, at least a, a background in which you understand all the troubles the people have and how your ability to remain civil, to even try to be kindly, is going to be much more effective and persuasive. I agree. I mean, I think civility is a matter of character and intention. And, um, you know, often it's the way you grow up. It's what you learn when you grow up. And uh, I, I was just sitting here thinking about uh, something that happened uh, by a foreigner who taught me a lesson. We were, I was leading a group of American congressmen and senators to meet with a group of Europeans. We were sitting around a big rectangular table and we were debating trade between the U.S. and Europe, and we had some pretty significant trade disagreements, and it, it, it became kind of testy and so on. And the head of their group, uh, Mr. Rochard, I believe his name was, the former foreign minister of France who was then in the European Parliament, he, at the, as we were going through this discussion, he pulled his chair back and he said, Mr. He said to me, Mr. Senator, uh, I want to tell you something. He said, we've been debating this in, in kind of tough language for an hour, hour and a half. He said, I just think it's important probably for you to understand how I feel about your country. He said, I was a 14-year-old boy on the street corner in the Champs-Élysées in Paris, France, when the U.S. Liberation Army marched into our city. He said, a young soldier reached out his hand and gave that 14-year-old boy an apple as he marched by. He said, Mr. Senator, I'm going to go to my grave remembering that very moment, what it meant to me, what it meant to my family, and what it meant to my country. I sat back in the chair kind of stunned because I'm thinking, you know, you talk about civility, you talk about being a little off-putting in terms of our discussion that we were having, and here's this man telling me how he felt about our country and what our country meant to him and what our country means to the rest of the world. I, I think sometimes those of us who serve, you can kind of get mired down and forget the larger picture. It's really important for us in America to be on America's team and to be part of what we do around the world and to respect each other here and so on. The lack of civility, I would say, here in our Congress, and that it, there is a lack of civility, we see evidence of it. Um, I, I, I just wish we could find a way to kind of turn back the clock a little bit to a couple of other periods, one of which Dick just mentioned, and see if we can't get along a little better and work together and think, you know what, we're all working for the same group here. We're all working for the United States and also a better and more peaceful world. I'm going to ask one more question to leave time for one question from the young Democrats and one from the young Republicans, and if you guys could work your way over. So my final question, Senators, for the students in the audience, what would you hope they will do to shape the tone and focus of politics in our beloved country? Well, I would hope that while each of you are students on this great campus, 
that uh, you would really learn the elements of civility we've been discussing today. In other words, be thoughtful about each other, be observant of acts of kindness, and really thank people. Be grateful, at least, for the friendship that you have, the opportunity that you have, as opposed to being super critical of the courses, the classmates, the teachers, or whatever, and really think constructively about all the ways that you have been helped and, uh, and fortified in this experience. And likewise, to uh, express that gratitude to your parents and to others who are supporting you in this endeavor. Now, this is a great school, but it's, it builds upon the fact that a great number of people have high regard and, in fact, love for each other. Mark Twain was once asked if he would engage in a debate program. And uh, he said, oh, yes, I certainly would, as long as I can take the negative side. And they said, well, we've not even told you the subject of the debate. Oh, he said, that doesn't matter. The negative side takes no preparation. <laughs> My hope is all of you always understand that. The negative side never takes much preparation. Be constructive. The positive side is what builds things. You know, a constructive opportunity to, to build things. That's what, that's what I hope will come from all of you. Uh, you. You all have leadership capabilities in lots of different ways at every level of interest in this country. And, and our self-government requires that at, at every level. It doesn't matter what level you choose, but uh, be involved. Be active and make a difference. Our first student question is from the head of the Young Republicans, Vernon Holloman. First of all, I would thank, I would like to thank both of you guys for coming. This has been a great honor to hear you both speak. So my question is, the conventional wisdom is that currently we may be in the worst bipartisanship in the history of our country. Given your experiences, is this a fair conclusion? In addition, are there any examples you can cite in your legislative careers where everyone came together when hope looked lost that should give us confidence for the future? Well, let me cite, uh, yeah, I, think, I think this is a really rough course time in our country's politics. I think it just is. And I, you know, I, I hesitate to mention this because I don't want to sound partisan. I don't mean to be partisan, but I, I think Honestly, the president's tweeting is a problem, and I, he's our president. I would prefer he not tweet. But having said all that, let me describe just for a moment uh, some bipartisanship because it relates to something that was discussed yesterday, tax reform. I'm going to just tell you of a moment. I, I, the last time we did major tax reform, uh, I was a member of the House Ways and Means Committee and helped write the reform, 1986. Ronald Reagan pushed very hard for it. Uh, Congressman Gephardt, Senator Bradley pushed very hard for it. And we had a, a, a man named Rostenkowski, a tough, brusque Chicago politician who chaired the Ways and Means Committee. The first day of the markup of this legislation, Rostenkowski decided this is going to be bipartisan and we're going to put a big bipartisan stamp on that and I'm going to make sure everybody understands it's bipartisan. So he invited the Treasury Secretary, uh, Jim Baker, and Dick Darman, the Assistant Treasury Secretary, from a Republican administration to come to the Ways and Means Committee, and we shut the door. We, back then, we, we did this markup behind closed doors, but Jim Baker and Dick Darman from a Republican administration sat in the room in a Democratic uh, committee to demonstrate at Rostenkowski's determination this was going to work because it was going to be bipartisan, and we wanted to get the best from both sides. So, I, you know, there are examples of that, and they are, they are sometimes rare. Uh, the example of when, when, you, when you talk about uh, Luger and Nunn, it becomes almost one word because it is such an important example of bipartisanship that profoundly almost changed the world. So there are examples, yes. I think there are opportunities Byron has, has cited them. Uh, I would suggest one further thought that uh, permeates the discussion. 
and, and that is that it is important for members to really get to know each other. To, and you would say, well, well they're there every day, they go by, by year after year. But we're in a particular period in which a good number of members make it a point that they want to spend the least amount of time in Washington possible. Might fly in early Tuesday morning, fly out late Thursday night, and um, make a point that they don't like Washington, they don't like living here. They make a point of, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, living in their offices, they sleep there at night, use the shower in the locker room in the morning, um, and making such a point of the fact that you don't like Washington to make a point with your constituents that you really like them, not those folks that are back over here, um, makes life very, very difficult. I, I, would, I would just say that um, the opportunities uh, must surely be abundant and they, they better be uh, accentuated. Um, one, one of them always for me was the Aspen Institute breakfast every Thursday morning. What a wonderful way I felt to start the morning with members of the House and the Senate, both parties, and hearing somebody who knew something about some subject, but actually uh, sitting next to people, getting to a feel for them, going to the Aspen Institute conferences around the world where there were husbands and wives of 20 members of the House and the Senate. And they got to know about their family problems, where they came from, and so forth. This is, I think, absolutely critical so that um, when the time comes, really, and, they, and there are a lot of these times really on the threshold for our country, you actually have confidence in people and they have confidence in you. You actually might even like them and have some ability really to influence the situation in that respect. Um, I, I believe that um, even rough as this situation is right now, the president is finding out a couple of things and, and that is that um, uh, when he takes the plane ride out to Indianapolis, where he did to talk about the tax bill, um, it's good to take along a, a Democratic senator from Indiana on the plane. Now, the, the president has a bad habit having done such a thing to point to that senator, in this case, Joe Donnelly, and say, now, Joe, you've got to be for this bill or we're going to come out and campaign against you. But the fact was that uh, there was some reach across the aisle, some beginning there, it was some reach when he brought the Democratic leadership to the White House so that they could, in fact, uh, push back uh, a date that would have made it impossible to continue the budget and, and so forth the other day. This was described as undercutting Republican leadership. Uh, the president discovered in order to keep the government going, he was going to take some action. Uh, I hope that there will be somewhat more of that that pragmatically he will understand that if any of his legislative situation is to move, he's going to have to at least get some friends. And they're going to have to have some reason to be friendly to him. Um, I pray that that will be the case. Our final question is from the President of the Young Democrats, Jake Davis. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. It's been an honor to meet both of you. Uh, I was wondering, what's the hardest decision you've had to make where the decision you're making or the vote you're taking might go against your party's values or goals, but you know it's the moral right thing to do? Well, th there, are, th there are a lot of them, honestly, and I, you know, I always voted against a constitutional amendment that would prevent flag desecration. Uh, I did that because I didn't want in any way to alter the First Amendment or what I felt would alter the First Amendment. I love the American flag. I think desecrating it is despicable, yet I didn't want to put something like that in the Constitution. I voted against the constitutional ban against gay marriage. Um, I did not believe that belonged in the U.S. Constitution. My constituents would have 
supported both of those constitutional amendments by with 70 or 80 percent, perhaps. I cast a vote uh, that my constituents probably supported to uh, allow the use of force for President George W. Bush to go to war. Uh, I've determined later that was a profound mistake, the most significant mistake I felt I had made. And that mistake was made as a result of unbelievably bad, in some cases uh, fundamentally wrong intelligence assessments, at least in one case, uh, and perhaps two, uh, answers to questions I asked were given me that were known to be inaccurate by those who gave me the answers. And so there was some things involved in that intelligence that, uh, that got the answer they wanted from the Congress, but I've always felt that was one of the profound mistakes I, I made. I wish I had not, but, but. so anyway, you, you know, but you vote on lots and lots of issues, and you do the best you can, and, and it seems to me if you are always a weather vane for what your constituents will always believe, you don't, you don't offer very much to them. You've got to use your best judgment to the extent you can, and then uh, go home and defend what you're doing and hope the people have some basic respect for what you have done. Well, I have a great deal of respect <coughs> for Myron's answer. Uh, memory fails me as to specific votes, uh, and so I won't try to, to think up some for the sake of the argument. Uh, I think that just as he's described it, as time goes by, you sometimes realize that the vote that you cast was not the right vote. You, you voted on the basis of the best information you had at the time, whether it was intelligence information or your own experience or uh, convincing arguments by colleagues that made a difference, or even to try to, to keep things going in cases so they would not break down. Um, and so I, I, as I review all those votes, I'm sure I would find some, all things considered, that I would do differently. But um, for the moment, I think I'll just have to pass on the issue. Thank you, Senator Luger and Senator Dorgan, for sharing your experience and w wisdom with us today. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. I do have a couple gifts that I'm going to walk over to you in a minute. Before we do that, I just want to turn to the audience and ask that we give one last Thank you to the senators. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a nice special time. To our to our audience, I also would like to thank you for your time, attention. You are a great audience. For the middle school, we're going to dismiss you first and let you hustle off to class. Upper school, stay seated, please. Middle school is dismissed. <laughs>